a funny story about how, like, one day she did, and I was fussing, and, and you know, and so then she would look down at me, and Kamala, what do you want? What do you want? And I looked back up at her, and I said, freedom! <laughs> <laughs> Ah, yes, that uh, completely fictional story made up by Kamala Harris about uh, the radical days in uh, radical Berkeley, California, where her radical parents were raising a radical child. You know, I think the response to this whole Project 2025 thing that they're trying to tie Trump to, a uh, basically a research paper out of the Heritage Foundation, I think I should turn that around and say, well, you guys in the Communist Manifesto, I, I think, are, have a closer relationship than President Trump and Project 2025. But that's not important now. I had a great deal of, uh, great deal of wacky uh, because, you know, the Democrats can't keep them in their cages. It's kind of... It's kind of tough. And when they're out and on the loose, you never know what will happen next. Now, let let me go to, uh, because it's Wednesday and it's mailbag day, I think we should go to the mailbag to make sure that I get to the mailbag. It is hour number three. And uh, if I don't do it in hour number three of a three-hour radio show, then when am I going to do it? That's uh, my question to you. All right, let's uh, so let's go to the mailbag. And we'll get back to, because the news media, they're, they're out of their minds and they're attacking President Trump. And we've got this special counsel, Jack Smith, who's a, political hatchet man uh, appointed by Merrick Garland, who is a bitter political hatchet man for the Democrat Party and the the Biden administration, the Biden-Harris administration. Remarkable stuff. Want to get back to uh, to some of that as well. There is uh, there is still a lot, a lot to go on. And I do, I, you know, the numbers of LGBTQ skyrocketing. Joe Biden's Generation, 0.8%. Gen Z, 19.7%. That's uh, that's quite an increase. Democrats, this whole duck-duck-goose program is really paying off. Making uh, headway. It's making headway. All right, let's get, to, uh, let's get to the mailbag. Let's get to the mailbag. Yeah, I looked up Kamala Harris. Somebody said, where's Kamala Harris's husband? Best I can, uh, excuse me, Kamala Harris's father. Uh, Donald J. Harris from Jamaica. And uh, it's hard to uh, find much on him. Uh, PhD, another oppressed PhD, 86 years old, born in Jamaica, came to the United States, married a, a an Indian woman, had two children, broke up, split, scrammed, got out of there. It looks like he probably lives in Washington, D.C. I bet he listens to my radio show every day. What do you think? Donald J. Harris, I bet he listens. But let me get back to the mailbag. Let's go to the mailbag. I have in my hand four mailbag questions selected by a committee of one, not me and not Michael Piercy, but Kevin Tober. And uh, question number one from Barry Tolbert. Barry Tolbert. Do you think the Dems are trying Obama 2.0 with Kamala Harris and Tim Walls? Kamala Harris, multiracial. She's multiracial, the Jamaican father and the uh, Indian mother from India. She is no longer with us. He is still uh, with us at the age of 86, but uh, nobody talks to him. Now, have you know, why doesn't the news media talk to, talk to Dad? What a fascinating interview that would be. Maybe Dana Bash should bring in Donald J. Harris and talk to him. But... Uh, but Barry says, do you think the Dems are trying Obama 2.0 with Kamala Harris and Tim Walls? Kamala Harris, multiracial icon, plus Walls as the new Joe Biden, folksy, phony blue collar, serial liar, serial self-aggrandizer, serial embellisher, pretending to be a man with mainstream values. It's a good question from uh, from Barry. Yeah, I, I you know you're 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 onto them again. Yeah, it's true. Um, this time uh, they have a multiracial and they love racial polarization, racial balkanization, pitting racial groups against one another. It's what the left does and has been doing for a century everywhere in the world. They love pitting 
racial and ethnic groups against one another. Look in any communist country and you'll see racial division being used by the communist regimes there. And we have that happening here. We have it happening now. And yeah, Barack Obama, whose mother was from, where is she from? Kansas. And, uh, and the father from Kenya. Kenya. Right? And he was a total deadbeat dad and a drunk and a no good lout and, and all of that. Uh, and then Barry Sotero, mom remarried after the Kenyan fled, uh, married the uh, Indonesian fella, Barry and, and the Sotero, and, and Barack Obama became Barry Sotero, right? Remember, they built that statue to him in Indonesia, and I believe they tore it down. I believe they've torn, in Indonesia, I think they've torn that statue of Barack Obama down. Uh, but they sold that as, you're not a racist if you vote for him. And then they sold, you are a racist if you don't vote for him. Even though he's the most, was then the most left-wing president that the Democrats had ever put up. But yeah, they are trying that again. And they're, of course, they're playing the race card all over the place, just like they did with Barack Obama, who was African American, you may remember. He was African American. Uh, his mother being a white woman from the American Midwest, who was being so oppressed in Hawaii that she started at a bank as a secretary and, and left as a vice president, but never mind that. And, uh, and they all get the world handed to them and never stop complaining, don't they? Yeah, and then Biden, they got the new Tim Walls. And, and it's true, Barry, that the uh, comparison you make, they got the race card over here, and this time they have different genitalia, presumably, internal genitalia versus external genitalia with Barack Obama, Otherwise, it's, the, it's basically the same card. They're playing the same card over and over again. And they love calling everybody racist, even though they're the party of the KKK. But, uh, but never mind that. And now uh, Walls, being the Midwestern guy, folksy, regular guy, who uh, self-aggrandized, and it's true, Joe Biden, self-aggrandizer, serial embellisher, uh, plagiarist. And now they got Tim Walls, who's a self-aggrandizing serial embellisher, um, you know, blue collar, fake blue collar, phony guy. Yeah, it, it is pretty much the same playbook, isn't it? It is. Barry points it out, and Barry is correct. Same thing over and over again. Yep, that's a fact. Uh, Don Kuczynski, Don Kuczynski, what's the over under for Kamala to come out in favor of mass deportations? <laughs> Because, you know, Kamala, she has uh, the big the big thing of the day is uh, flip-flopping because Kamala flip-flopping all over the place. The media says it's okay, though, because she's a Democrat and they're Democrats, too. And in fact, on CNN, we uh, I don't think we've uh, I don't think we, I don't know. I guess we've used a couple of audio sound bites and mailbag before, but we have CNN, CNN doing their their level best to say, well, sure, Kamala Harris has flip-flopped on the wall, which she said was anti-American, un-American, over and over again. And, and now she's in favor of building the wall hundreds of millions of dollars. And they lie about it and say, well, it's not very much money. And this was in the bipartisan bill, which wasn't a bipartisan bill except for one Republican who got suckered into it by Mitch McConnell. But never mind that. Um she was against fracking, but now she wants to win Pennsylvania, where fracking is very popular and an economic uh, uh, you know, powerhouse and uh, lots of jobs. So now she's all in favor of fracking. And she saw President Trump came up with the idea of not taxing people on tipped income. If you work as a waiter or a, a croupier, I just wanted to say croupier, uh, she's in favor of that. So she's, you know, well, actually, we have uh, Kamala saying President Trump is a terrible person because he wanted to put up a wall and Kamala didn't like it. This issue is about a vanity project for this president. Right. That wall ain't gonna stop them. No. 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 <laughs> Yeah, it's a vanity, it's a terrible vanity, which she's now in favor of. On the subject of transnational gangs, let's be perfectly clear. The Trans. president's medieval vanity project is not going to stop them. Use this last night on my Newsmax program at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. Kamala Harris really didn't like the wall. This 
president's medieval vanity project called a wall. It's medieval. It's a vanity project, and she really didn't like it. It's uh, terrible. But now on CNN, Sarah Seidner, a fake uh, news reporter there, um, she said, well, yeah, sure, Kamala's flip-flop, but... You know, Trump did too. Kamala Harris and Donald Trump both being accused of flip-flopping flopping on a lot of different Flocking. issues. Flocking? No, um, no, he's know, not. She's talking about spending hundreds of millions of dollars on a wall along the southern border, something that she called un-American during the Trump administration. She says now that she does not support the electric vehicle mandate, while in the Senate she was in favor of eventually outlawing, outlawing um, petrol-powered cars. That's uh, very good, Sarah Seidner. You, you got, uh, got, you know, what about the uh, fracking and uh, taxing tips and uh, detention camps and, you know, death camps for illegal aliens? And the Vanity Project is now Kamala's Vanity Project. Uh, Donald Trump, for his part, has plenty of things he's. Uh sort of flip-flopped on, you know, banning TikTok, and now he's totally in favor of TikTok, uh, demonizing undemocratic, uh, undocumented immigrants. Undemocratic. Um, and now he's saying, oh, they should get visas if they go to college. That's a lie. That's, uh, that, I, that is, and I heard this liar lie that, and I said, well, that, that doesn't sound right. Um, the reality is President Trump, in a uh, talking to a podcast, podcast recently, he, uh, he said for... Immigrants, not illegal immigrants, who finish college, so come here and get a degree in engineering or something, you know, come from, come from uh, India, you go to Berkeley, you get a degree in engineering, you should get a green card. He didn't say illegal aliens, but the news media just leaves out a word here and a word there, and they pretend that they're telling the truth, but they're not. But he did say... If you go to college, you graduate, not while you're going to college do you get a green card, you get a student visa. Uh, but if you're here legally on a student visa, you get your, your uh, diploma, your degree, and uh, now you've been here for years working hard, uh, earning toward, uh, working toward a degree, you earn the degree, and then you're in a, and he said, I've heard him talk about this before, in an area where we need more people, engineering and so on, then you get a green card. Now, that makes perfect sense. But what she said was that you're an illegal alien, and now he wants to give you green cards. And that is not true. Not true. Headlines that the Democrats don't like. Harris flip-flops on building border wall in Axios. Um, and then the Fox News headline, total bull beep. Uh, Trump campaign rips preposterous Harris pro-border wall narrative after media report. Harris has backed bipartisan security bill that included some funding for a wall, and they're uh, spinning it like, uh, like mad. Mm-mm-mm. Yeah, so uh, Don, Don asked, what's the over-under, Kamala, to come out in favor of mass deportations? Honestly... Here, here's the thing. We were talking about this last night on the right squad as well. And uh, she can flip-flop again. If she were to win on Inauguration Day, she can just, again, say, well, we're not really going to build a border wall, and I'm not really in favor of fracking, and I'm not really in favor of not taxing uh, tipped income uh, because she's a Democrat, and she can flip-flop all she wants. And she could, you know, if the poll numbers say mass deportations are popular, she might just say, yes, I'm in favor of that because she can reverse it all again later, and the news media will give her a tongue bath. That's one of the benefits of being a Democrat. Rock Chick 111. So Zuck admitted to helping rig the last election, and the Dems respond by indicting Trump again. That's what Rock Chick 111 says. Is there an end to this lunacy? Uh, no end in sight, Rock Chick. No end in sight. That is, uh, that's a fact. Now, this is the left, and they, they can get away with murder because of a corrupt institution called the Fourth Estate, the news media. The news media. I have, uh, I have one more mailbag question coming up as well. You know that the best-selling Eden Pure Thunderstorm air purifier uses Oxy technology, which helps to quickly destroy a whole lot of viruses and odors and mold and more floating in the air Thousands of glowing five-star reviews on Al Gore's amazing internet 
works like a champ. Any smell will vanish. Just a few seconds with the thunderstorm being on. Odors from litter boxes and dirty diapers and cigarette smoke and and trash cans. Left-wing protesters, no match for the Eden Pure thunderstorm. You know, the powerful thunderstorm sends out O3 molecules that help to seek out and destroy odors. These molecules even go behind and underneath furniture because nothing can hide from the thunderstorm and no filters to buy and replace over and over again like a lot of air filters. It's uh, one unit you can hold in your hand just like this, plugs right into the wall. Not a big piece of furniture. So start enjoying the air in your home and your office again. Get several thunderstorms because right now you can save $200 on an Eden Pure Thunderstorm 3-pack for whole home protection. You're going to get three units for under $200. Just put one in your basement, your teenager's room, any place you'd like to breathe clean, fresh air. All you have to do is go to EdenPureDeals.com and use the discount code CHRIS3 to save $200. That's EdenPureDeals.com. The discount code is C-H-R-I-S and the number 3. I ask one more, one more mailbag question. And now, as uh, Rock Chick 111, is there any end to this line? No end in sight. Uh, and I, I do have a, an update. The, the Washington Times has a story on Zuckerberg. I hope to get to also. And he has held up the United States government and its workers around his vanity project called a wall. Ah, yes. They lie and they lie and they lie, don't they? Amar Musa. Amar Musa of the Harris Walls campaign. Amar Musa is the uh, uh, Harris uh, Walls campaign director. Said, President, Vice President Harris does not support an electric vehicle mandate. Does not support an electric vehicle mandate. That's another flip-flop, you see. Because in 2019, Senator Harris was the co-sponsor of the Zero Emissions Vehicle Act. That's the electric vehicle. In 2020, running for president and then running for vice president, campaigned on all new, didn't get very far running for president, campaigned on an all new car sales be zero emission by 2035. That would do away with combustion engine cars Uh, Or petrol, as the CNN reporter said, petrol cars. Amazing. And she also pursued the biggest EV agenda in U.S. history during the Biden administration. But now, with a straight face, they put out Vice President Harris does not support an electric vehicle mandate. They lie about everything. Everything. And I have uh, one more mailbag question, and it has to do with Ronald Wilson Reagan. And I'm, uh, I apologize. My last and uh, final mailbag question for today, Wednesday, mailbag day. What was Reagan like in person? I know you met him a few times. What was he like? What was he like? Um, it's true. I had the, uh, the distinct honor and privilege to meet Ronald Reagan uh, even before he became president of the United States. I first met him the night of the California primary in 1980 in Los Angeles, California. Uh, and I was 20 years old, and I was a Democrat. And, and I was told that Ronald Reagan was going to destroy the world and kill us all, and nuclear apocalypse is the inevitable result of any Ronald Reagan presidency, and the economy would collapse and all of that. And I met Ronald Reagan at uh, the Ambassador Hotel um, and I was there as a courier, as a courier. And I got to say, first time I met him, and Nancy Reagan was there, and daughter Patty Reagan uh, was there too. And I had kind of long hair and a skinny guy and, and in the hotel room. And I met him, and Ronald Reagan couldn't have been nicer, and Nancy Reagan couldn't have been nicer, and Patty wasn't so nice. But uh, Ronald Reagan couldn't have been nicer. I remember I was, I was quite surprised, and I, and I had this extraordinary moment where I rode the elevator down because I was a courier and there was a camera crew with him, a CBS News camera crew. And I was to follow it. And the camera crew uh, left the hotel room with President Reagan. It was then Governor Reagan. It was before he was president. And, and he was, it was post-governorship, of course, but he was running for president. 
Uh, and and I rode the elevators down with him at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles, California, which was the hotel, and it was the night of the California primary in 1980. Twelve years prior, 1968, the night of the California primary, Robert F. Kennedy was shot and killed by Sirhan Sirhan in the same hotel, in the same hotel on the night of the California primary. Completely crazy. And uh, the elevators went down, and it became clear there's but not very large scrum of people headed toward the motorcade uh, underneath the hotel. But he was being taken through the kitchen at the hotel, at the hotel. And uh, that's where Bobby Kennedy was shot at the same hotel 12 years earlier, the uh, night of the California primary. And it was the night of the California primary again. And Ronald Reagan wanted to stop at the spot um, where Robert F. Kennedy was shot and have it explained to him um, at the location where Bobby Kennedy was shot. And the general manager of the hotel, I believe it was, was there. And Ronald Reagan stopped, and the manager is pointing at the floor and saying that's where Bobby Kennedy was laid out. And the name of the, the housekeeping guy that was cradling Bobby Kennedy's head in his hands and stuff. And the general manager of the, of the Ambassador Hotel told Ronald Reagan the story in Exquisite Detail, and I was standing there for that, and I was slack-jawed. I was like, wow, I can't believe that Reagan wants to stop and hear this story. And Nancy was like, okay, Ronnie, time to go tugging on his elbow a little bit. She was not enthusiastic about standing there the night of the California primary 12 years later at the same location where then-Senator Bobby Kennedy was shot and killed by Sirhan Sirhan, and that was kind of an amazing thing. And I was, And I was kind of awed by the fact, and he was... Ronald Reagan was curious, and he was soaking it all in, and his, he was a little bit intense and just watching the whole thing, and that was, and that was kind of amazing. And I, uh, that was a wow moment for me the first time I met uh, Ronald Reagan. And then I got to meet him many times after that and after he became president, and I was living in Santa Barbara, and I was still working as a courier and going up to the ranch, the Reagan Ranch, and, and parties in Santa Barbara, uh, these annual parties, because he would go there every year in August for most of the month of August and stay at his ranch, Rancho del Cielo. And, um, and I got to meet him again and again. And I, and I just, I got to tell you, I thought that he was the greatest guy in the world, the nice guy, the most polite, um, friendliest. And he was friendly to the least among us. I was a courier. I was nobody. And he couldn't have been nicer to me all the time. And I could see that he was great to the hotel staff and to all the nice people. And and he won me over basically uh, right away, and and it was uh, great meeting him. I'm not sure how many times I should know how many times ten times uh, that I met him. And then I moved to Washington uh, from California. He was still president. Went to the White House Christmas party with Ronald Reagan because now I was working for CNN and I was a news guy and all that stuff. Uh, and uh, yeah, what was he like? He was the nicest, uh, kindest, most uh, polite. <laughs> Let's go to a Manchurian candidate, buddy, buddy, who was just great. Uh, and I admired him very much uh, as a person and obviously as a president, one of the great world leaders, certainly of my lifetime and, and beyond, one of the great world leaders of the 20th century. I, um, I attended his funeral at the Washington National Cathedral, and I walked over to then Prince Charles, now King Charles, and... Uh, and I walked up and there was nobody around him except his little minion. I've told this story before on the radio, but uh, not a long time. And and I thanked him for being there for uh, President Reagan's funeral. And he said, oh, so dead. with his hands clasped behind his back. And he said, oh, so dumb. Uh, after I shook his hand, I woke up and shook his hand. Um, and uh, then he clasped his hands behind his back. And I said, well, I think it's great that you could be here for President Reagan's funeral. And he said, well, I, I wouldn't have missed it. One, one of the most important figures of the 20th century, he said. Figure, he said, figure, figures of the 20th century. And he was indeed one of the most important figures of the 20th century. Uh, and I'll pronounce figure correctly, even if now King Charles uh, III uh, didn't. Remarkable stuff. Yes, sir. Yeah, so uh, what was he like in prison? I, you know, honestly, and I never saw him, I never saw him, like, you know, a harsh word for anyone. And I, and I saw him in a lot of different circumstances on the ranch, at uh, other people's houses in Santa Barbara, uh, at the White House, Christmas parties and uh, things. And uh, truly, uh, well, I'm very, very fortunate 
that I got because it opened my eyes. Grew up being raised in a Democrat household, uh, going to Santa Barbara City College at the time, hearing that he's going to destroy the world on the evening news and in the newspapers and in, in uh, classroom uh, at uh, Santa Barbara City College. He's going to destroy the world, late night TV. And then, of course, the exact opposite turn. He saved the world uh, and made it better and made the economy great and smashed the Soviet Union and uh, was one of the great heroes of probably all of human history. Not to overstate, but but there it is. Man, oh, man. And I was just uh, during the break. I think I should tell this again, too. I was just uh, during the break. I said I, I woke up. I didn't tell the story yesterday. But yesterday when I woke up, I was sleeping, you know, like a normal person overnight. And in the 5 a.m. hour, I woke up and I was in the midst of a dream, a really intense dream. And my dream, I had uh, I had jumped out of an airplane. We were flying over the ocean and I jumped out of an airplane and I was by myself. And uh, I was in the midst of a free fall for quite some time. And I could see, uh, cutting through some clouds, that the ocean was beneath me. And there was what appeared to be a ship over there, a ship over there. And I'm free falling. And I pulled my parachute. Now, I, I mean, I've I've done three tandem jumps and I jumped out of three air, but uh, three airplanes, but there were tandem jumps, and and I'm so here I am in my dream and I'm free falling and I'm by myself and there's nobody else around, and I pull my parachute because I see a ship over there in the ocean all around, and and I and it was a you know a, a rectangular parachute and it's got the tethers and I'm pulling the tether and I'm maneuvering over to the ship because otherwise it's the ocean, and as you get closer I see it's a yacht, it's a private yacht, it's a giant yacht, huge hundreds of feet, with a heli- helicopter landing pad on the on the front deck, on the bow. And I'm uh, free flying, and then I, I pull the chute, and I'm, I'm maneuvering over there, I'm maneuvering over there, and the ship is moving, the, the yacht is moving, it's underway. And I make my way, I, I maneuver my way over to the yacht that's uh, headed toward me, and I uh, direct myself to the bow, to the big H with the helipad, the landing pad, and I skid onto the, onto the deck of the yacht, and the parachute is uh, full of air and wind, and it's pulling me over the side. And I was able to grab the the tethers and pull the and pull the lines and collapse the parachute, so I wasn't pulled over the side of the yacht. And I, as I pulled it into myself, I I stood up and I looked and I'm like, hey, I landed safely on the bow of this yacht. And that's when I woke up. <laughs> and that's when I woke up. It was a good dream. I love good dreams. <laughs> and the only reason I told Piercy that is because this morning when I woke up, I was landing on an aircraft carrier uh, in a in a C two Greyhound. I was landing on an aircraft. That was what I woke up to today, and I landed, and we were just taking off again when uh, when I woke up, which uh, which was fun too. I love dreams. I always have good dreams. I've always had uh, uh, you know high adventure dreams because I like them. Uh uh uh. Okay. All right. Now let's uh, let's uh, let's take another phone call. I haven't gone to a phone call in quite a while, and let's talk to the nice people. Let's go to let's go to Christy calling from Stafford, Virginia. Christy, you are on the Chris Plant Show. Hi, Chris. Um, how are you today? I'm Christy. Uh, I'm very uh, well, thank I, you. Uh, hi. I I heard you talking about the Arlington visit from President Trump, and um, I was there. I'm um, Sergeant Nicole G's mom-in-law, and our family um, was all with President Trump um, on Monday. And um, I just wanted to let everybody know and your audience know that, um, you know, we welcomed President Trump and we didn't see any altercations whatsoever. And we were honored to have him there. And him and his team have been everything that is respectful and honoring to our families. Uh, wow. You are, you are the mother-in-law of, uh, the young woman, uh, uh, Nicole G who was killed that day in Afghanistan. And you were there day before yesterday at Arlington with president Trump. Did you go down to sex section 60 with him also? Yes, sir. Yes. Our, our whole family did. Wow. We were honored to have him. Uh, he, he, um, has continued to be the the man and the president I've come to know and, and, you know, frankly love. And he spent time with our families. He spent time with some of our wounded warriors from that day. And, um, you know, again, we didn't see any altercations. I'm not sure where any of that's coming from. It was a beautiful event and just full of love and respect. Wow. 
Wow. Uh, first-hand eyewitness testimony as opposed to an anonymous, unnamed NPR single source which has caused this this upheaval. And now the all the news media are are all over it because National Panhandler Radio started the whole thing. But, Christy, I'm so happy, I'm so pleased that you called in uh, to to tell us what you saw and what really happened. Now, there was the wreath-laying ceremony, right, and President Trump participated in, in that, and there were no, there were no Democrat politicians, and, and you know, I don't want to drag you into politics. You, you sound like you're definitely a supporter of President Trump, but there was no, we know there was no Kamala Harris. She's running for president. There was no Joe Biden. These are the people that botched the withdrawal and and uh, their mismanagement led to your your daughter-in-law being killed in that terrorist attack. And uh, you were there for the. Do you live around here now? Yes, sir. I, I live close close enough to visit Arlington whenever I want. <laughs> wow. And um, and so you were there, and you would you would say that there are some problems with the NPR reporting. I sure would. I, I'd put it in the same category as the press and the media who want to say that we're liars when we talk about Biden checking his watch at our at our children's dignified transfer almost three years ago to the day right. um, that happened. I was there for that as well. And, you know, when President Trump says that they're not after me, they're after you. America needs to start paying attention because we've lived that now. And, and he is right. They're, they're coming after, um, you know, the wrong people. And um, eventually it'll be the American people. Uh, absolutely correct. And now uh, you and a group of uh, family put out a statement in support of President Trump, correct? Yes, sir. We sure did. And uh, uh, we, we, we hate for this to get turned, you know, like this, because the reality is he's he has been everything that that we've looked for from our current administration, where we've been blacklisted and completely ignored. And uh, and in the statement that you and other family members who were present uh, put together, the statement says we had given our approval for President Trump's official videographer and photographer to attend the event, ensuring the sacred moments of remembrance were respectfully captured, and so we can cherish these memories forever. Now, that's uh, part of the, the statement, and we are deeply grateful to the president for taking the time to honor our children and for standing alongside us in our grief, offering his unwavering support during such a difficult time. His compassion and respect meant more than words can express. Now, Christy, I've got to say it's a beautifully written statement, and it and it conveys the sentiment that you're expressing here as well. Um, and what do you what you know what what should we make of this, Christy? And this is this is just our corrupt news media. I mean, I talk about them. I don't know if you listen to the show frequently, but I I certainly talk about our corrupt, our filthy, rotten, corrupt news media as being the most corrupt institution in America. And this is just one more example of that, isn't it? It sure is. And, and I'm, I'm, I hope that, you know, the American people and your listeners, they need to research their own information and get get the information that they're not being fed because the, um, you know, the usual sources aren't your friend. The usual sources are not your friend. That is a that is a fact that you probably know my friend Matthew Foldy. I sure do. I very much enjoy and respect Mr. Foldy. Yeah, he's uh, he's great. He's uh, Matthew Foldy is a reporter and a friend of mine, and he is uh, he is regularly on uh, my Newsmax uh, television show. It's going to be on tonight. He was on last night, uh, and uh, Matthew Foldy, I know, has been very involved with uh, with uh, you and your the the families uh, uh, of the. Uh, the, the bombing at, at Hamid Karzai International Airport. And, and I know he's, uh, he's told me about his, uh, his time, time that he spent with you and other family members. And uh, Christy, I've, I've run out the clock again. I'm very happy, I'm very appreciative that you called in uh, to, to give us the real story, the real scoop. I'm very thankful. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. We appreciate it. Thank you. God bless you. 
Yeah, I'll look forward to meeting you in person uh, since we live in the same neck of the woods and all that. And we know the same people. Uh, thank you. God bless you. And I'm, I'm saluting you, Christy. Thank you. Now, uh, President Trump sat down with Dr. Phil. I'm not going to get to the Kamala Harris 220 million Americans dead from COVID, but maybe tomorrow. Uh, and President Trump sat down with all, all people, Dr. Phil, Dr. Phil. And Dr. Phil asked him, do you think uh, Biden and Harris were happy that you got shot? I'm not saying that they wanted you to get shot, but do you think it was okay with them if you did? I don't know. I mean, I don't know. There's a lot of hatred. Um, I don't know why. Uh, I had a great presidency. We had the best economy we've ever had. Best economy we had control over our border. There was no war in Europe. There was no war in the Middle East. There weren't violent mobs of young Democrat boys and girls, young men and women terrorizing Jewish students on campuses across America, as is happening today, happened again day before yesterday at Cornell University, violence, vandalism, graffiti, uh, the madness that is the left on the loose in the United States. They're fanatical. They're anti-Semitic. They, uh, and 19.7% identify as LGBT as a 19.7. Joe Biden's generation, 0.8%. Uh, Gen Z, 19.7% identify as LGBT because the Democrats are you know, making a lot of headway. Can you say headway in this, in this context? That's pretty, uh, pretty amazing stuff. Yeah, President Trump and uh, Dr. Phil, I didn't, you know, what is he, what is he doing now? Some kind of a, a thing. Uh, but President Trump spoke to him. Hey, do you think that they were happy he got shot? I think that we all know the answer to that. It's about time we got a hold of all that uh, of Crook's social media activity, too. If only we had something like an FBI. <laughs> 